NVIDIA ISEC SIM with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics. Hello and welcome to the Robohub podcast. In today's episode, we'll be hearing from Amit Goel, Director of Product Development for Edge AI and Robotics at NVIDIA. He speaks to us about an exciting collaboration between two of the most popular robotics development platforms, ROS and NVIDIA's ISEC SIM. The ISEC SIM is a scalable robotic simulation and data generation tool that can simulate real-world environments, including many of the most common robotics use cases, to help develop and test AI-based robots, thereby reducing the costs of collecting real-world data. Today, Amit discusses how their collaboration with ROS will enable roboticists to use NVIDIA hardware platforms to their fullest potential, using the hardware-optimized chips on board the platform in a way that ROS was previously unable to, opening up new avenues for development and testing. Hey there, welcome to RoboHub. My name is Abate, and I am very excited today to be speaking with a member of the NVIDIA team. For the last several years, I've been working with several teams building embedded products, and many of those products were based on the Jetson line of embedded boards from NVIDIA. So very excited to have this opportunity to speak with you today. Could you give yourself a a little bit of a background? Hey, Abate. Thanks for having me on the show. So I've been at NVIDIA for about 10 years now. Uh, Started my career here uh, doing chip design and methodology. And uh, for the last uh, five plus years, I've been managing our Jetson products. And, uh, you know, our first Jetson product was conceived in 2014. Uh, It seems just like yesterday. But uh, we've come a long way uh, since then, and uh, we now have a pretty extensive portfolio of products uh, that we develop, and they're widely used in robotics, and it's definitely one of the biggest area where we are seeing a huge adoption for uh, Edge AI uh, based on NVIDIA solutions. And what are you up to currently at NVIDIA? Now that the Jetson line has been out there and matured for a little bit, is there anything else that you're also pursuing? So yeah, I, you know, now that we have a pretty solid portfolio of products, uh, the biggest thing we are focusing on is how can we enable our customers to go to scale and build these things quickly uh, and have more more capabilities. So uh, we we have, of course continue to invest in making our hardware better. The the demand for more compute doesn't end, right? So we are always looking at that, but uh, we are also investing a lot on the software side of things uh, to enable the robotics developers to maximize the value that they're getting with the platform and also quickly, rapidly iterate in the designs process using the tools that we're providing. So those are, those are the two areas uh, we are heavily investing in. Uh, related to that is simulation as well. Uh, we, we believe that uh, to really make things go faster and to truly achieve the potential that's possible today with robotics and sensor and compute becoming available, the thing that needs to be really uh, move faster and better is simulation. So we are, we are developing a, a simulation platform called Isaac Sim where people can develop their robots. And it's the, so that way is we are, thinking about the end-to-end workflow for robotics from training, developing, simulating, and then deploying onto the device with Jetson. Yeah, and what you touch on is it's really important because a lot of the hardware platforms that are out there, uh, maybe they're not fully utilized to their max ability, um, and it's really that software that enables it. And then on top of that, adding that extra piece of that full system integration for the simulations. Um, Can you dig in a little bit into the simulations um, that that you're providing, and maybe what some of the other things on the market are that are going after the same market. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So you know, the, the robotic simulation has been around for a while, right? But uh, the as we look at the modern AI robots, that what is different about them is they have a situational awareness, they have a perception capabilities. They're going to be existing alongside with people. So they're going to be, they have to be flexible, they have to be fast, and they have to be friendly, right? 
So to develop that, those capabilities, the traditional simulators that you've been using in the past, where you're just testing your algorithm, you're just testing your you know, motion planner or a control algorithm is not enough. You want to be able to do things like reinforcement learning, where you're teaching your legged robot to learn to navigate different kinds of environments. Or you want to do perception. You want to, you want your robot to be able to detect a particular object, whether it's a person or a forklift or what the environment looks like. Semantic understanding of the world, uh, going out and collecting real world data and testing in real world is expensive, not safe, and slow. Right. So how do you how do you build these modern AI, modern robots that have those capabilities? So for that, we created Isaac Sim with the with and it is designed from the ground up, keeping in mind the needs of modern AI simulation and modern AI robots. And what I mean there is we are thinking about physics. So NVIDIA has a physics engine that's built to an, into it that provides really high fidelity physics capability. So you can model your sensors with really great accuracy. You want to model the contact between your uh, robot and the and the, and the environment, you want to be able to do that with really good physics. You want to detect collisions. You want to have good physics for that. So we are we are building up uh, the simulator that has a really good physics. The second thing we are doing is uh, photorealistic rendering. If you want the robots to be uh, to have functionality and capabilities based on perception, then you need to have your simulated world look very close to what you see in the real world. So the photorealistic rendering that comes with the Isaac Sim. It comes in very uh, handy there. And the third thing is all of this is built on our Omniverse platform, which is our platform for Metaverse. And uh, what we're doing on Omniverse side is bringing the 3D content of all the world together on a single fabric. Right? The biggest challenge with simulation at scale comes down to how am I going to bring in all my data into the simulated world? And so with that's one thing that we are addressing with the Omniverse, where we are bringing connectors for all, all popular 3D tools that are there so that, you know, once you're creating a simulation environment, your design team can use it, your planning team can use it, your robotics team can use it, because now it's a shared canvas on which everybody is building. So, so those are the, some of the things we are doing. And, um, very recently, in, this, in that same spirit, we announced a partnership with Open Source Robotics. And the goal there is that people who start their journey with Gazebo and want to then migrate into Isaac Sim because now they want to do perception, they want to do reinforcement learning, they want to do AI training. They are able, they will be able to bring in the robot models. So we already support URDF import, but they will also be able to bring in their robot environment. So we're going to have a path for bringing in SDF files from open from ignition gazebo into isaac sim so they can continue their investment in simulation and continue to develop their advanced capabilities for their products yeah and you touch on an interesting transition that's happening in a lot of robotics where they're moving outside of controlled environments and going into more uncontrolled environments where this simulation becomes even more necessary and you mentioned that the the photorealistic capabilities so this means that the cameras are actually they're capturing the video, and then is this going to be used, say, for uh, on the vision side for training the reinforcement learning, and being able to run these what would otherwise be very expensive tests? Absolutely. That that's the the two things to it. One is yes, you want to te test your algorithms, vision based algorithms in in simulation, right? So you can do that because now you have a camera sensor that is feeding you real. Uh, you know, photorealistic data that you can feed into your control algorithm and see how it's behaving. And the second thing that is also very important is synthetic data generation for training of your AI models. Uh, we often hear from our customers that I have a, you know, this particular failure scenario happens, but it doesn't happen too often, right? So you want to, once you understand the failure scenario, you can simulate it in, in, uh, with really good quality and uh, realism in, in Isaac Sim. And now you can generate a lots and lots of data around that same failure scenario, right? If you know that your robot is not able to detect people uh, in a certain lighting condition, you can simulate that. And now you can do domain randomization. You can change the background, textures, uh, size of people, and create a lot of data 
and uh, feed it into you know a training framework. So we have a training framework called Tau. You can use the simulation to generate all this data, train it, and then then do a closed loop testing whether to compare. Well, before it wasn't recognizing, now it's recognizing. And once you're there, you go and deploy it onto the robot. Mm -hmm. And to sort of ground this in inside of an example, um, let's say you have a, a soccer game that's happening. And you want to simulate this soccer game for your robot. Um, it's going to be, let's say it's filming in, is driving around on the field, right? Mm -hmm. How would you go in and create that synthetic data for something that has complex um, motion and then people moving and all of these different aspects and then different times of day and all of that? That's a great question. So. Uh, that that's that is exactly why you know the omnibus platform is important because what we're doing there is we are bringing in lots and lots of different ecosystem partners so in, in order to simulate something like this you first need to have a uh, be able to import the 3d assets right your your soccer game stadium your characters that you want to be able to simulate uh, your your soccer ball your goal and all, all with all those details that you want right so you can do that with the different importers that we have. Uh, we have importers for Unreal, we have importers for SketchUp, we have importers for uh, Blender. So there is, we have connectors so that allow you to bring in all these 3D assets. The second thing you now want to do is you want to define physics attributes for these characters and the assets that you've imported so that you can realistically simulate. You do, you, when you somebody kicks the ball, you, know, you want the ball to roll. You don't want the person to walk through the ball and the ball stays there, right? So, so you need to be able to define physics. So for that, we have APIs and interfaces so you can define the physics for all the 3D assets that you've imported. The third thing you would want to do is now you want to simulate motion of people that is realistic, right? You, you, don't, you don't want people to be teleporting and testing your algorithm. If it can tra trace people teleporting, that's not going to work, right, for this camera. So, so you can define your own animation, uh, you know, the, for, for these characters, but you could also do things like we had a partnership with Wrench where uh, you can capture real people, right? Motion of real people. And then you can say, I've captured it. Now apply this to this particular character in, in simulation. So the people are going to follow the same thing that was captured by just a smartphone. You can capture it from a smartphone and transfer it over to an animated character in, in, in Omniverse. So you can define all of those scenarios. And once you have that, now you can let these agents run around, stream the data out from the simulator, test your algorithm on, is it following people? It is, if it is not following people, you can create more of those scenarios uh, for, for training this algorithm to track people and recognize people in the ball and uh, do your development that way. And the last piece, of course, will come. You need to do some domain adaptation, right? So this is all done in simulation. You will have to then come back to the real world and see where it's failing. And then it's continuous loop. You want to bring in real data and back into the simulation and keep training it. You dropped a, uh, a very significant point earlier about the partnership between NVIDIA and Open Robotics, the makers of ROS, and right. then all of the integrations that are happening between ROS, um, Gazebo, and NVIDIA. So can you touch a little bit more on that? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, today the when people are developing their initial uh, robotics, they, they want to use the ROS gazebo because uh, they're not doing any heavy duty uh, graphics. They're just testing your basic controller algorithm. But as they advance into now, okay, I have my basics of working. I want to now do perception or I want to do reinforcement learning and I want to do uh, high, high quality physics, right? I do care about collision. I'm not just uh, driving around. I want to detect if I'm colliding into objects. So they, we want to provide a continuous path for people to be able to transition from their ignition gazebo world to the uh, Isaac Sim world. So for that, we're doing two things. First of all, we are building uh, connectors again so that you can bring in all your 3D assets and the second thing we already do today is we have a ROS uh, communication or interface bridge. So if you have your ROS-based application that you have developed, you can get all the sensor data and motor control sensor data from the simulator published to your ROS application stack 
in a ROS native format. So you will get the same message format that you would get from a real robot. And then you can also send the controlled messages uh, in, in ROS format, and it will be consumed by the simulator and translated into the control signal for, for the robot. So, so importing your URDF, importing your SDF so that you have an same environment uh, that you had in Gazebo will be there in Isaac Sim, and then providing that ROS interface so your messaging and communication between the application and the simulated world uh, can happen without you having to rewrite anything is, is, is an area where you're continuing to work with the open robotics. Yeah, and you touched on the importance of the NVIDIA Isaac simulation um, and how that can really strengthen up ROS um, and that development environment. So what are some of the other benefits of using both of these side by side? Yeah, another area with so part of our open robotics uh, engagement is in simulation, but there is another area where we're working with them closely is on the actual deployment, right? The ROS runtime or the ROS uh, middleware. Uh, ROS middleware is great, and we are working with them on the ROS two, which is uh, which has you know even better reliability and more features compared to ROS one. However, there is still a gap from when you look about when you think about uh, hardware acceleration, right? Uh, ROS two is inherently assumes distributed processing, but look, if you look at a modern SOC and something like Jetson, which is purpose built for robotics. We do not have a single homogeneous computing element, right? We have six different yeah. processors on a single Jetson. Can you just describe, jump a little bit into what you're talking about and what middleware is as well? SOC is a system on chip, and it essentially combines multiple uh, hardware components on a single chip. Uh, if you look at uh, the Jetson, we have up to six different processors on a single chip. And that's why it's called a system on chip. We have a processor for image processing. We have another processor that's doing your multimedia processing. So video encode, video decode, JPEG processing. We have a processor called the deep learning accelerator, which can do you know, your typical convolutional neural nets, the more traditional AI models. <clears throat> we have a processor called the uh, a computer vision processor. That's where you can do your typical traditional computer vision functionality. You're, you want to do edge detection, you want to do Harris corners, you want to do semi-global matching, you want to do optical flow. So all of those things can be done on the computer vision accelerator. Uh, we have, of course, our CUDA-based GPU, which is a general purpose compute, where you can run all your AI models or you can run any other accelerated computing functionality that you need uh, for your robotic stack. And then we have an ARM-based CPU, right? And uh, so we have all these different processors that are specialized for different tasks that you may need in your robotics application. Now with ROS, uh, since it's de uh, developed for uh, an architecture where you do not have so many different components on the same chip. If you run it on Jetson today, you can leverage all the different compute elements, but the data flow between them is not efficient. You would see that the data has to get synchronized every time to the CPU, and then it'll go to the GPU, then back to the CPU, then back to a deep learning accelerator. And so that is not efficient. You can get the acceleration for the specific algorithm, but if you're looking at your end-to-end -end robotics pipeline, that that is not very efficient. So with the, the work we're doing now with open source robotics is that we are making sure that the, the underlying middleware, which is essentially a plumbing, right? It's what is connecting the different, the connecting fabric between the different aspects of your robotics application. If you think about navigation, you have a planner, you have something that's creating the map, there is something that's creating the localization, there is something that is perceiving the world. So all of these things need to talk to each other, right? And so that's the underlying fabric that ROS provides. And we are working with them to make this fabric be, be aware that there is a, a system and chip on board on which this is running. And 
you can pass this data across these different processes without having to take the overhead of synchronizing everything onto the CPU. So this will enable people to have much, much efficient pipelines for their end-to-end -end robotics application. So today they can do really great perception with Jetson, but now with this uh, enhancement, they will be able to do multiple things. You will be able to run perception, you will be able to run your AI, you will be able to run your control, you will be able to do all of that uh, in a more efficient way. And when you say that it's more efficient, do you have an order of magnitude or some sort of uh, measure of how we can think about this? Yeah, uh, we, we do expect, uh, you know, uh, quite, quite a bit of improvement. And again, we'll have to see the final results after the work is done. But uh, if a good example is uh, a pipeline that we provide on Jetson for streaming video, which is called DeepStream, where it starts from taking the camera all the way to your AI inference. And we do that without any memory copies. And if you look at that pipeline, which is completely optimized for the platform versus a pipeline that you may build up by taking each of these components and stitching them together, we see up to 4x, 5x improvement in the throughput that customers see. So, so we are pretty excited about uh, this work that we're doing, and we really believe that it's going to help our customers and developers get more out of their jets and devices when they're running ROS on it. Yeah, one of the things I can really see this helping to transition is more of a push from doing a lot of the computation up in the cloud over down to the edge because once you can actually take advantage of all the hardware optimizations that are offered by some of these boards, a lot of the computational costs of doing things in the cloud can be removed. And then applications like running it in real time, suddenly they start opening up. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, a lot, lot of, lot of capabilities that were limited to being done on the cloud will be, are going to be possible to be done in real time on the device. And uh, one thing I would mention here is, it, and this is not limited to the Jetson devices. You know, when, when you're running it on even a discrete GPU attached to a host, even then today, uh, the, the message handling and the data flow between the host and the GPU with ROS is not efficient. And so, so this work will enable everybody who's using, whether you're using a Jetson-based system on chip or uh, base architecture, or whether you're using a discrete GPU for your robotics application, you will see a better performance. And uh, and def as you mentioned, it'll, it'll bring in the applications which were limited to be run on the cloud will be possible now to be done on the edge. So you know, inspection and looking at drones flying autonomously and robots driving on the seat sidewalk it's it's all going to be uh, possible now yeah you mentioned a, a couple of very interesting applications um, where this gets very interesting and it sounds like a lot of things where there's large amounts of video data um, lidar data potentially um, there what are some of the other applications that really stands to benefit from this yeah, uh, most of the applications that will benefit from this is where you need uh, you need high performance, real time uh, perception capabilities, uh, and uh, whether it's through lidars or multiple cameras, uh, the robotics applications for as the AMRs in the factories, uh, the only way to scale them out is to allow them to have perception. Today they're Basically, most of them are running on a 2D LiDAR, but if and that restricts them to the areas in which they can operate and environments in which they can operate. But to maximize their potential, they will have to exist, coexist with people and other, other machinery. So you will have to have, uh, you know, surround perception on those systems. And once you bring in that much data, you need to be able to process it on the device itself. So what, that's an area that will benefit. Uh, we are seeing a lot of need for last mile delivery on, you know, for robots delivering food on the sidewalks. These things pretty much have a sensor stack 
comparable to an autonomous car, right? So they, they do have lidars, they do have stereo cameras, they have multiple surround perception. And so they, they, they are going to benefit significantly with all the compute capability and the improved end-to-end -end, uh, application performance. We, we are seeing a lot of need for uh, this in uh, logistics, you know, pick and place. Uh, we, we know right now there's just so much demand for robotics in logistics, whether on both manipulation as well as on mobility. So moving goods around as well as picking things and packing them. And that, that is another area where, you know, the speed is important. The ROI is very dependent on the speed at which and accuracy with which these robots can pick the objects. So the latency is extremely critical there, both from safety reasons as well as from performance reasons, right? So, so th those are, another, are some of the other areas where we see this will really help. Mm -hmm. And so for startups who are just starting out and maybe they've written their initial full stack in ROS and not really thought about optimization yet, more researchers who are kind of in the same boat, what's the process like for them to go from this very unoptimized software stack that they've written to something that can really leverage everything that is available from the hardware in front of them? Yeah, we, we've thought really hard about this and, uh, how we can make it easy for developers. And so in that spirit, we have created this Isaac Ross packages. And uh, what you've done, these are Ross native packages that we're providing uh, for, uh, and we plan to make it available for every release of Ross. Uh, Ross. We're starting off with Ross 2. So we are making these available so people can, uh, they don't need to change much of the code, right? Instead of using the uh, open source version of that particular uh, library, they can uh, use the Isaac Ross version of it. And without having to change much in their API or their code, they would be able to benefit from the hardware acceleration. Uh, we have a library that's available right now for April tag detection and uh, for uh, stereo depth estimation using semi-global matching and uh, image rectification and uh, color space conversion and we see just by just substituting the package you they see our customers and developers are seeing anywhere from four to five x improvement in the performance and it's doing two things first of all it's using the right accelerator on the board to accelerate it and the second thing it's doing is it's reducing the load on the cpu and uh, so once your CPU is less loaded, it, it has a huge impact on your application, right? It, uh, it guarantees QoS. You don't miss out on certain things because your CPU was busy processing something else. And uh, it reduces, uh, it improves your overall throughput and reliability of the system and gives you headroom to add more functionality. So, so that we are seeing uh, both the benefits uh, using this ROS native Isaac ROS packages to, and, and it's really easy to integrate as well. There is not much you have to do in terms of rewriting your code or application. You just switch out uh, the functions with the, with the Isaac ROS version of them. Mm -hmm. And so we've spoken a lot about the ability to make simulations and that would lead to creating very beautiful digital twins and very highly accurate, as well as leveraging all of the hardware components and the acceleration to optimize your workflows as much as possible. What are some of the other software goals that are being pushed at NVIDIA and what's uh, coming up in the future as well? Yeah, we, we, are, uh, we are always thinking about uh, how can we enhance the platform? How can we provide the tools uh, to the, for the developers? So we are thinking about what are some of the commonly used algorithms or uh, AI-based uh, fu functionality that the modern robots are going to need. So it, uh, if it means, uh, are, are all robots going to need a free space segmentation capability? If, if the answer is yes, we, we are thinking about how can we make that available? So you don't have to start from scratch. You're not spinning the wheel or something that has already been solved, right? So we are thinking a lot about the algorithms and the applications that, that, are, that are the ultimate building blocks 
that you would need for building any modern robot. If I, do you do all, every robot needs to know 3D pose of objects around uh, and in the world. So how can we make it easy for developers to to have out of the box solutions where they can get the 3D pose of people and objects around them? Uh, all manipulation robots need to be able to do motion planning around dynamic obstacles. So what libraries can we build? So there, there's a lot of work that we're doing uh, in our robotics research lab, which is based out of Seattle, headed by Dieter Fox. And uh, so we are we are thinking about what what is the next frontier, right? Uh, how can we make robots collaborate and exist around people? What functionality will they need? And in with that in mind, what capabilities are needed for simulation? What capabilities are needed on algorithm side and what capabilities are needed on the hardware side. So uh, we, and then we identify those and we continue to work on all three of those. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the software stuff that uh, is being developed, this is currently offered for free, correct? And is the purpose of this to bring people onto the hardware platform and then have companies come and they scale out using NVIDIA as their backbone architecture? Absolutely. We, 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 we believe that the robotics as a vertical or as in technology needs a lot more to scale out, uh, to, to grow faster. And that is, that's what we are focusing on right now. What can we do to make this technology uh, grow faster, get adopted faster uh, and get developed faster? And uh, we want people to be able to do that on our platform. And so that's why we are making all of these tools available. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us on the podcast. Great having you. Thanks, Abate. It was very nice talking to you as well. And that's all for today. If you enjoyed this week's episode, check out our previous episodes at robohub.org forward slash podcast or wherever you usually get your podcasts. And if you have feedback, episode ideas, or might be interested in joining the RoboHub podcast family, we're always happy to hear from our listeners. So just get in touch with our podcast lead at abate.de.mey at robohub.org. Our next episode will air in about two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye.